Hello. Welcome. All right, so what we're going to do is we're going to go over the first test, okay? And I'm going to try to balance, uh, you know, just um, giving you the information you need uh, with without just absolutely giving you the answers, okay? And so um, hopefully you received my, uh, my uh, announcement earlier today. Uh, you have until the 7th just to do quizzes 1 through 3, and quizzes 1 through 3 are posted now. So make sure you get those finished, okay, and submitted by the 7th of November. And then you have until the 10th of December to do quizzes four through six, all right? And this, uh, it, it worked out perfectly with a 17-week semester. Uh, we have 14 assignments and three tests. And so we get to a lot each, uh, we get to a lot a week to each um, endeavor. So you have all week to do this test, all right? But please don't procrastinate. And know that you have on test one unlimited submissions as well. Okay, and so I'm going to move up the page here. So historians, right, when they, uh, they put their categories together on what they believe to be the major themes that have been instrumental in this country's history, uh, they tend to um, uh, make a... Uh, a kind of chronological split at the end of the Civil War. Uh, but it, it's pretty much impossible, I, I think almost irresponsible, uh, to do Reconstruction without going a little bit over the Civil War, right? Uh, to give you context, because context is huge. The surrounding you know, circumstances, situation, et cetera. So at any rate, to the Civil War, I wanted you to at least be familiar with the macro interpretations to the Civil War as to why this war was supposedly being fought, all right? And so uh, remember court history, uh, like with an emperor telling his scribe, uh, he wants a history written of him and his kingdom. It's gonna make him look glorious, right? It's, gonna, it's going to justify and praise uh, that which was done by the winners, right? Uh, politically, economically, and socially, the winners. So hence, right, the North won the Civil War, the federal government won the Civil War against the 11 states, 11 and a half states of the South. And so at any rate, they, um, court history, it stands to reason, is going to praise the North, it's going to praise the Union, the federal government, uh, for this war. And remember, court history is also tied to American, American exceptionalism, and that's the notion, right, that we are a special, different country. We stand out from other countries. And so a typical country, right, fights over power, resources, et cetera, but not an exceptional one. An exceptional country, right, fights over lofty ideals, over, over lofty principles. And so thus, the Civil War, you could easily guess, is going to be interpreted as a crusade, as a moral crusade to include African Americans into the promises of the Founding Fathers. And when you look at the Founding Fathers, there was a great, great discrepancy uh, between what was uh, practiced and what was preached in the War for Independence or the Revolutionary War. Uh, you look at whether you look at Scottish libertarianism uh, as a source, you look at the uh, evangelical enlightenment as a source, uh, or Great Awakening, I'm sorry, or you look at the French Enlightenment and uh, pretty much all of them were not congruent with slavery, with, with human bondage. Uh, so at any rate, they, they finally, in the court hist history books, they finally get it right. They finally have the courage to take this on, right? And they're largely um, you know, promoted or catapulted by a, a, a very idealistic, brave, uh, numerical minority known as the abolitionists and reformers, right? So the abolitionists and reformers, they make a lot of noise disproportionate to their small numbers, and they force the country to have discourse on the issue of slavery, in particular, the morality of slavery, right? And not just the constitutionality of it. So at any rate, 
not only do they do this, but then in the 1850s, you have polarizing events. You have events that almost force Americans of that generation, of the antebellum generation, to pick a side, if you will, right? So you look at the Dred Scott case. What's to be uh, as far as the status of African Americans, slaves, and not even slaves, just African Americans, uh, in all states, in free states in particular, right? And in Western states in particular. Um, you look at the caning of Charles Sumner, you look at the uh, raid by John Brown, you look at the uh, Underground Railroad. These are very polarizing events. And then you also have, according to this traditional history interpretation, you have the timely arrival of Lincoln, who begins almost indifferent by his own account um, uh, about slavery, and he develops uh, a conscience, if you will, and develops a sense of courage uh, as he ages, and he, he comes around just in time to become a pivotal uh, component to the emancipation of the slaves. So there you have it with court history, right? So revisionist history wants to challenge or revise or change uh, that interpretation. So to them, right, there are other issues at hand uh, that, that you could find plenty of primary source material to support, and uh, as well as the court interpretation. And that is, right, is one is that it could have been a power struggle over sovereignty. Who is sovereign to make the, the, the decisions about slavery? Well, since nothing is in Article 1, Section 8 about, about emancipating slaves, nor in Article 2 with the executive. Some people contended, well, the 10th Amendment states that everything that's not been presented up to this point is reserved to the states. So some people, to some people, it was about states' rights versus the federal government's power to intervene in Mississippi, Alabama, Virginia, and tell them what to do with their slaves, okay? And then also the, the ability of the federal government to make decisions about the territories that were becoming states that just muddied the waters uh, further. So you have revisionist historians that wanna focus more upon that and say, that's what it was really about, not so much a crusade. And then you also have others contending, right? That it was, uh, it was a factional dispute. Remember a faction according to James Madison is a group that share, shares the same ideology and or the same self-interest. And that the latter part of that definition is what we're focusing on here, is when you look at the dominant factions in the North and in the South, they tended to represent in the North uh, the bourgeoisie, the people of the city, the merchant class, the creditor class, uh, the entrepreneurial class, in particular, the big uh, mill owners, right, who would later become known as the, as the robber barons. And uh, in the South, you had the planters, the big slave-owning uh, plantation owners as, as the main lobbyist group, if you will, or faction in the South. So were they trying to fight over whose image the West was going to be made in, right? Revisionists tend to focus on that and say that's what they think it was about. And they point to hypocrisy in the North, right, and how they were treating African-Americans, indifference amongst the soldiers of the North, uh, et cetera. So you, you have that debate that plays out. So that's what we're talking about with numbers one and two, okay? With number three, you could have easily guessed it. Uh, when I have a, 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 a big kind of bifurcation on an interpretation of a certain, uh, you know, group it, or uh, demographic in history, and one interpretation is very in very much contrast to the other, oftentimes I try to do both, right? I try to convey both and let you critically think for yourselves. And so hence, uh, the court historical interpretation makes heroes of the radical Republicans. They were known as radicals for a reason. They, they didn't care about the constitutionality of the issue of slavery. They took it on as a moral issue. Uh, they were a lot more you know, um, uncompromising uh, than the moderate Republicans were and a lot more concerned for the plight of slave slaves, okay? And then likewise, that carries over into the, the uh, Reconstruction era. You have people like Thaddeus Stevens and others, right, who wanted to give full citizenship rights to African-Americans. But you also have William Dunning's thesis and revisionist historiography contends that the Northern Republicans, the radicals, 
were uh, just as, as, as bent upon revenge upon the white South as they were upon any kind of humanitarian concern for African-Americans, contending that that which they did for African-Americans in the South, they did it rather vindictively, right? And so hence in my, in my uh, write-up, I write them kind of as a, as a mixed bag, if you will, uh, uh, showing, uh, I even mentioned Thaddeus Stevens as perhaps an example of how both those interpretations could coexist in the same people. Uh, wanting revenge upon the white South, knowing the damage that it would do to the establishment, the antebellum establishment, and helping and empowering the African Americans, but also genuinely wanting to help them. All right, so I feel like we've kind of done numbers three and four now. All right, so if you have any questions, let me know, but I'm going to go ahead and move on. Uh, agency, right? Remember, this comes after the civil rights movement, when a lot of historians contend, you know what? It, we understand that historians had their hearts in the right place when they engaged in conflict history and tried to get us to empathize with those who lost and, and to vilify those who won and, and hence try to elicit our sympathy in particular for African-Americans, especially during the time of slavery. But they contend we, doing that in and of itself doesn't give full justice to the reality that even people in a, as seemingly helpless of a situation as in bondage still were human beings with, with free will, with volition, and they chose to use it, and they made decisions that mattered and contributed to the direction in which history went. And so it's known as agency, right? And so they stress the agency of African Americans and contend, wait a minute, they played a part also, even as slaves. So an example of that would be the culture creating capacity of slaves, how they helped with cuisine, with music, with religion, and several other facets of Southern culture, they contributed to it, even as slaves. So what about their agency, you know, uh, during and after the Civil War? Well, you're familiar with this, I'm sure, is, you know, some, uh, uh, ran away, and I get different percentages from different historians that I've I've read. Um, but uh, you have some ran away. Uh, in large numbers, they followed the Union Army. Uh, over 180,000 joined the Union Army to fight as African American slaves for the for the Yankees for the Union. Um, some of them made demands upon their plantations. Uh, they, they, they utilize their agency, right? They also congregated with one another to empower, to educate, right? And, and to provide comfort to one another and meaning uh, during this very tumultuous era. And so uh, you have a big role and an initial sense of deference toward those uh, who were outside the norm of, of slavery, right, who had a little bit more time, a little bit more latitude of movement, who perhaps had access very anomalously uh, to some education. So, for instance, the, uh, the preachers, right, the Black preachers, they were looked upon naturally by other African Americans as natural leaders of their communities. You also had the freedmen, uh, those because manumission, the formal emancipation of an individual slave did happen, right, even in the South. And so you had freedmen communities like in Charleston, South Carolina, and New Orleans, Louisiana. And so uh, freedmen took, took the roles as well as African American uh, soldiers in trying to educate and forming Liberty Leagues and Union Leagues and meeting in churches, et cetera, to try to educate their brethren, their black brethren, and, and try to uh, uh, just give them a, a focal point uh, from which they could, they could realize their own destiny, right? Uh, and, and be at least a little bit um, educated about what was going on uh, in the times, uh, politically especially, and militarily. So at any rate, that deference, however, according to historians like Eric Foner, uh, did not necessarily remain. That by 1868, three years after the Civil War, in the height of, quote, the radical phase of Reconstruction, you had in many areas like the Black Belt of Mississippi, 
uh, a majority of ex-slaves who were now being elected into office, right? Uh, and so that deference, as you see there on, um, num on uh, option D, that did not remain, uh, that changed. And so there came a time which it actually became kind of in vogue uh, to have been a slave out on the plantation and to say it gave you more of a sense of credibility uh, as far as being a, a spokesman for African-American people. And so at any rate, when they did uh, inhabit office, right, we talked about this, they did dismantle the black codes, they did initiate safety net institutions, and they did help develop at least the beginnings of a new South, right, and more in Alexander Hamilton's vision, industrialized, urbanized, diversified, et cetera. They at least got it in that, going in that direction, all right? And so uh, you see their contributions of reconstruction. The virtual end of the antebellum planter class's domination, uh, economically, politically, and socially, according to Eric Foner, yes, uh, this was, a, this was um, successful uh, during reconstruction. Uh, improvement in infrastructure, diversification, and access to credit in the South, according to your handout, and to Eric Foner, uh, mainly upon whom I relied for the handout, uh, yes. Uh, the establishment of safety net institutions like orphanages, public schools, and asylums, yes, as well. All right. Um, for the failure of reconstruction, you can get this right out of Alan Brinkley's textbook. Uh, I, I believe nearly all of them are put in here um, or included. But we talked about the fact that establishing the beginnings of these, you know, arguably welfare capitalist economies in the South, uh, it nothing costs nothing, right? For lack of a more articulate way of saying it, uh, you have to have money uh, for the orphanages, for the public schools, etc. Right? All that costs money, and so in initiating what we would consider very worthwhile institutions uh, for for the Southern people. Uh, the, 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 the Reconstruction era state Southern governments uh, spent themselves into debt. And so that became a problem as far as, you know, when people point fingers and try to, to find a pattern uh, of causation as to why and how Reconstruction failed, that's usually included in, in the dialogue. And also, um, you know, uh, the complaints about, quote, Negro corruption, and that was mentioned in your handout. And so that was absolutely true. And the failure of white Southern Democrats or right Southern Republicans uh, to come to the aid of African-American uh, politicians, uh, that is a, that's also included in the handout, right? As far as lost opportunities and uh, waning zeal on, on the first number of the reconstruction assignment. And then loss of public interest, particularly in the North, uh, as I mentioned and likened it to like 9-11, uh, Reconstruction lasted 12 years. That's a long time to keep the people's attention and their passion on that subject, especially as you did the next two, num the next two topics, right? Uh, the beginnings of the Gilded Age and issues with uh, the big business uh, titans, the, uh, the conquest of the Far West and the Native American tribes, all that drama with railroads that begins monopolizing uh, the articles in the press. And so people lose interest in what's going on in the South. And then the final straw, right, is arguably uh, Rutherford B. Hayes, a Republican, ironically, right, the party that emancipated the slaves and initiated Reconstruction, a Republican candidate, um, promises the House of Representatives when no one receives a majority of electoral points, uh, it goes to the top two, and the House decides, um, and he promised the House that he would evacuate the South, uh, take the, the Yankee troops out of the South, were the House to pick him. And it worked for him. He became president, and he did withdraw the troops. And shortly thereafter, you have the, quote, redemption of the South, where the Southern antebellum elite uh, and the white Southern citizenry intimidate African Americans uh, trying to go to the polls, initiate uh, terrorism with the Ku Klux Klan, 
and utilize their uh, their political machinery uh, to gain to regain control of the state uh, southern governments and to marginalize again the African Americans. And so the number of the politicians virtually dis dissipated. Uh, black politicians in the South, and the Jim Crow laws were established, which were not much different from the black codes. All right. And so uh, they're going to have to fight this again 100 years later in the civil rights movement. The 14th Amendment, that's a, a probably a poor um, description of it uh, that I, I probably could do better on, uh, but that is intended to be true on number eight. Uh, remember, it just said anyone simply born or naturalized in any of the states is guaranteed is guaranteed the rights, protections, and privileges of citizenship in all the states. All right, Turner's thesis. You guys know that, right? The West renewed meritocracy, indiscriminate dangers, uh, oh, uh, opportunities open wide for anyone shrewd and lucky enough. Right. So when you look for evidence to support that, you have mineral rushes, you have the um, the cattle bonanza, you have access to free or cheap land, you have the um, uh, opportunities uh, to become an entrepreneur. Right. Like we use the example of mining the miners, uh, and and also uh, evidence of relative lawlessness. Right and certain window, uh, open windows chronologically uh, when there was no law and order in some of these Western towns and some of the mining towns, et cetera. All that would serve to support his thesis. And then the two numbers that went against his thesis, right? The first one was Marxist, just contending, right? That, that we don't buy this equality of opportunities, state conflict historians that we believe that those who already had a lot of wealth had a huge advantage over those who didn't, right? And so uh, we've gone over that theme a couple times. And so you have that. The muscle sloth incident, remember we talked about that with squatters were kicked off the land because of the uh, Santa Fe Topeka Railroad came in and uh, had precedent over them with its political patronage from Congress. Uh, more powerful than that of a, a, a written document from a local judge. So that, of course, would, would support revisionist his, history. And um, Hispanics in the West, following kind of uh, some basic Chicano historians, uh, Felipe, Armes, uh, Felipe Armesto, uh, Rodolfo Acuna, and um, uh, well, I'll just name those two, but uh, some some big ones that I've tried to read. Uh, it's a it's a combination of conflict history and and um, emphasis on agency amongst Hispanics in the West. So the conflict history is going to state how they were uh, victimized. Uh, many of them lost their lands despite the, the promise not to to do so in the Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo at the end of the Mexican American War. Uh, many of them still lost their lands, and I won't take the time today. Uh, it was in the handout as to how that happened. Um, many of them were kind of uh, uh, pigeonholed into the proletariat, right? Uh, the term proletarianization is used by Eber and De Leon in their standard book, Hispanics in the West. And so, um, yeah, all that happens as far as conflict history on number 13. And then with number 14, right, is that uh, it focuses upon their agency. What did they do? Well, they fought back within the system economically and, and, and chasing after the American dream. And in some salient cases, uh, achieving it, New Mexico, uh, Southern California, San Antonio, Texas, established a well-to-do middle-class and upper-class Hispanic uh, capitalists and farmers, etc. And then you also have uh, the fact that they um, they continue to uh, to to fight politically for office and to elect fellow Hispanics uh, Hispanic Americans uh, into office. Esteban Ochoa was a big mayor of Tucson, Arizona, and vocal uh, defender of Hispanic rights. Uh, the Gorras Blancas, the White Hats, 
uh, ran uh, people for office, as well as engaging in extra political activities. And then speaking of extra political activities, um, you have social banditry, uh, like with Joaquin Murrieta, who uh, was the source of the fictional character Zorro. And then also, right, uh, the Chicano historians are proud of the fact that Hispanics um, maintain their culture very successfully, okay? With the Chinese, we see that they, um, they did develop two reputations, right? And one of them was, a, was rather ironic. You look at the Chinese Exclusion Act of 1882 and Congress in, in the language uh, pretty much, you know, uh, continually um, praises them, their image as workers, that they were diligent, hardworking, they were efficient, they did their work quickly. Uh, and that they were docile, they did as they were told without rebelling, and that therefore they were taking Americans' jobs. So that, that argument, that simple argument of economic jealousy uh, plays into this. And they also contended, right, with uh, you have political cartoons and lots of stuff from the press. Uh, when you look at pictures of the Chinese, that are drawings and paintings, they were awful. Uh, uh, just accentuating um, uh, almond-shaped eyes and, and teeth and, and just made them look very, very different, for lack of a better adjective, uh, and contended, right, that they were unwilling and unable to assimilate, uh, to drop their culture and become American. And so you had that argument as well against the Chinese uh, immigrants and the Chinese Americans. Um, okay, and um, and the Japanese are going to experience something pretty similar, although arguably not to the same magnitude. Uh, um, in the the last decade of the 1800s and the first two decades of the 1900s, uh, so much so that the Japanese government is going to intervene and speak with our president on at least one occasion with President Roosevelt. Um, Anti-Asian sentiment did not wane. Uh, out of sympathy for their plight on the Transcontinental Railroad. Uh, 14,000 of them worked for the Central Pacific for Crocker, and about 1,200 of them died. Um, railroads in the West uh, have almost always been uh, depicted, uh, highlighted by conflict and or Marxist hist history books, uh, because they're at a case in point, right, of those with political capital with political connections uh, enjoyed a great advantage over those beneath them without such political capital and actual economic capital, all right? Um, the Native American tribes, uh, you should find uh, a lot of this in the handout in that section on Native American. Uh, it should mention factional politics, uh, trying to offer uh, for the votes of people offer more and more Native American land to the voters. And you're probably familiar with that from uh, if you've taken 101 uh, with the, the era of Andrew Jackson and the Trail of Tears. Uh, state governments and army leaders define or manipulating federal laws and treaties and policies, absolutely. And you have examples of that in the handout. The role of individuals, absolutely, uh, making things worse. Uh, uh, engaging in, in individual, you know, I think of the, the Sand Creek Massacre with Colonel Shivington. Uh, he attacked Cheyenne because the Cheyenne were allies with the Sioux, and the Sioux had an uprising way back in Minnesota. And he uses that as a pretext for attacking the Cheyenne in Colorado. Um, eventually, uh, Let's see here, uncompromising U.S. demand that natives remain on reservations, yes. Uh, that happened as well, and that led to the, the slaughter at um, Little Bighorn, uh, which in turn elicited a public demand for vengeance uh, upon the Native Americans. Uh, anytime, again, the mechanization process, right, is described, oftentimes is described in conflict history. Because again, it was an example of those who had capital, who had more money, uh, enjoying a great 
uh, benefit as far as economies of scale, being able to outproduce their smaller competitors. So that's used uh, oftentimes in revisionist and conflict history, uh, not in court history, and not to defend equality of opportunity as Turner did. Uh, Cincinnati and Chicago, I just kind of threw that as just a, as, a, as a factual thing, not a lot of uh, intellectual argument behind that one, uh, but, but that one is true. Uh, the meatpacking industry also served as like hubs of union uh, between the, the Midwest, the old Midwest and, and the East. Uh, that is true. Um, the second industrial revolution, number 21, you should be able to find all of this in um, number one of the Gilded Age handout. Uh, but take a look at the last one, support of union organization. Are you sure about that one? So take a look at number one and see if you find evidence of the writer trying to contend that, that uh, there was, first of all, that there was government support for union organization. And second, that that helped produce a, a conducive environment for industrialization to occur and to, and to flourish. All right, um, let's see here. The idea of casualties of progress is often marked uh, by conflict historians, right? those who seem to have, quote, lost politically, economically, and or socially uh, during um, in historical processes like the second industrial revolution. And it's easy to infer that if there were people that lost in the industrial process, uh, skilled workers who work with their hands as opposed to fighting against machines and the beginnings of assembly line production, so hence artisans that they probably didn't fare very well, uh, small scale entrepreneurs, you see that on number two of the Gilded Age handout, how they didn't fare very well against uh, the titans of industry like Carnegie and Rockefeller. And unskilled laborers, uh, you get the depiction in conflict history, and this is arguable, that, that, that leaving the proletariat was very, very excessively difficult. All right. So then also, right, I, I find this to be a curious juxtaposition, and it is intended to be true. The Gilded Age supposedly entailed an increase in per capita income, right? So by average, by average per person, income went up during the Gilded Age and consumption. But ironically, it was alongside a broadening gulf between the wealthy and the poverty stricken those two did seem to coexist, factually, according to the data that, that historians get a hold of. So what was the message about Rockefeller and Carnegie? in uh, um, what was it, number, number three, I think, of the Gilded Age handout? And you guys know that, right? Remember the argument? that if you take money from the wealthy and you equally distribute it to everyone, that within 10 years, everyone will return to the state in which they presently find themselves. So the notion, right, that those who are wealthy aren't wealthy by accident, that they possess certain attributes, they've engaged in certain types of behavior, they've made certain types of decisions uh, that have, um, by which you could say that they've, they've They've earned it, right? Uh, let's see here. Conflict history and looking at the, quote, robber barons and forming trusts, receiving special rebates from the railroads, uh, engaging in price conspiracies, uh, influencing stock market conditions like Jay Gould, right? Achieving vertical uh, every phase of production and horizontal gobbling up the competition integration. Is that emblematic of a fair capitalist system? Are you sure a conflict historian would say that? Because remember, an example of conflict history is Marxist history. So they're not gonna praise capitalism. They're not gonna say, hey, whoever, it's part of the game, it's fair and square. Uh, they believe that the system is rigged, right? Uh, for the wealthy. 
And speaking of which, right, the, the accusations of the United States consisting of a uh, comprising a plutocracy, a rule by the wealthy uh, in cahoots with the, the, the government, right? And so what is some supporting data for that? And you should find that out of the last number of the Gilded Age Part 1 assignment. So look for that because it does mention uh, judicial things, right? It does mention tariffs. It does mention lukewarm enforcement of the Interstate Commerce Act and Sherman Act, right? It does mention them going against strikes, uh, against strikers, all right? So take a look and see which one of those is wrong. Let's see here. The Interstate Commerce Act and the Sherman Antitrust Act, Remember that they entailed government regulation over the economy. And they did it, right, to hold in line, to hold responsible big businesses in particular. So is that in line with laissez-faire principles? Remember, laissez-faire means let it be. So you guys should know that. All right, the Wabash versus Illinois decision, that cut short, right, it curtailed uh, state government's ability to regulate railroads if the railroads engaged in interstate trade. All right. So think about that one as well. Is that really showing a favor of government intervention if they're, if they're against the regulatory laws? Okay, Alan Trachtenberg's thesis, hate the system and not the winners, right? Hate the system and not the winners. Uh, in particular, mechanization that he contended, right? The process of mechanization and the, the, the hyper competitiveness of the growing markets and all the variables that can go awry, um, that it, it created a precarious feeling, a sense of insecurity, a sense of uh, urgency amongst the, the titans of industry and forced them, nearly forced them, right? In their minds did so uh, to almost become ruthless as far as what try to cut their overhead by almost any means possible and maximize their profits, et cetera. So hence, it's the system that should be blamed and not the, the quote, robber barons, all right? I pretty much gave you this one because it's not included in the handout already. Uh, number 30, uh, some historians suggest that the consumer revolution, and remember with consumer revolution, people have consumed things, right? For goodness knows how long. Um, but no, the, uh, the idea, right, of mass consumption mass buying of products that are not technically um, necessities, right? So buying nice clothing, buying movie tickets, uh, buying uh, uh, tickets to uh, um, uh, some type of amusement park, et cetera, right? Those would constitute examples to me of the consumer revolution. Modern professional sports, and the modern notion of leisure time, particularly the weekend, right, and, and, and vacation, were intended by big business to mitigate or make less severe class tension? Absolutely. That has been argued. It still is argued. To what extent it was successful? I know not, because you look at the number of major strikes and other, you know, kind of uh, indices of, of class tension, and of course, they they remained, uh, but who knows? It's something to think about. And let's see here. Uh, remember the new immigrants were not, uh, they didn't come from, from uh, Western European political stock, right? Uh, WASP, white Anglo-Saxon Protestant. A lot of them were uh, from the Balkans, from Russia, from the Near East, et cetera, right? So they were Muslim, they were uh, Jewish, uh, religiously and ethnically. They were uh, Roman Catholic, 
uh, like the, the Southern Italians, etc. So absolutely. Uh, the Jewish immigrants, you should get that right out of number one, right? On your latest assignment, Gilded Age assignment number two. Remember, de jure means by law. So did I state on number one that there was uh, discriminatory measures written in law in the U.S.? Uh, all right. Did I contend that there was anti-Semitism that they faced? Did I contend that they fared pretty well as far as socioeconomic mobility or ascension moving up the socioeconomic pyramid? Or did I state that they were confined to the proletariat for at least two generations? Those are all quite contradictory, so I, I definitely would be cynical about all the above. But take a look at that, okay? I don't want to, I don't want to give every single one to you guys. I, and you guys should know this. I, it's it's pretty explicit, even in the title. Uh, on number one in uh, the second assignment of Gilded Age. All right, and then uh, the next one pertains to the next number, uh, the immigration policy, according to the very title. Was it in line with Emma Lazarus's poem? Remember her poem stated, come bring me your weary, uh, your, uh, your refuse, right? Did we have just a simply open arms, extremely tolerant policy of immigration, according to that number? Or is there evidence of us trying to weed out certain, certain immigrants? All right. And Italian immigrants, right? Uh, you should find uh, the argument on the last one, uh, the last two questions on the last one, hopefully. Um, and that is, is that the Italian Americans in particular couldn't win, right? According to the title, that they were stigmatized, they were marginalized. Uh, no one really opened their arms to them politically, except for the political machines who tried to buy their votes. And then both parties were resented when that happened. The mainstream unions like the AFL, the American Federation of Labor, uh, did not admit unskilled immigrant laborers into their ranks. So what do you know? Some of them joined more radical labor unions and became stigmatized for doing that. And a lot of them couldn't find jobs except through Italian brokers, a padroni. And then they were resented for taking jobs because they kind of monopolized certain industries like construction and road work in the East Coast. So it's as if they couldn't win. And yes, there was uh, at least mentioned by me uh, uh, verbally, if not in written form in the last number of the last assignment, the correlation, right? The coexistence of groups historically that have suffered poverty and marginalization and high rates of, of, of uh, reported crime. And the five points was used as an example. All right, so how are you guys doing? You feel fairly well about this test? Remember, you have unlimited submissions on this one. Yeah, I have um, one question. Yes, sir. Could you um, explain a little bit more about question 28? 28? Mm -hmm. So yes, the Wabash versus Illinois decision was utilized in the handout to convey an evolving Republican Party platform that increasingly opposed laissez-faire principles in favor of stronger government intervention. So I intended 28, to be honest, to be false, okay? Because uh, this was uh, it, it used as an example that the federal government did not want the railroads to be um, hyperly regulated uh, or else they wouldn't have done away with the Granger laws in that decision because the Granger laws were trying to hold the railroads accountable. 
And by stating in that decision that no, if their business goes across a single state line, then it that that responsibility of regulating them uh, devolves to Congress under Article One, Section Eight. It includes right regulating interstate trade. But everyone knew Congress was doing nothing to regulate the railroads and was likely not going to. You know what I'm saying? So yeah, I, I intended that one to be false. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Also number three. So I have a question also about number three. Sure. Let me so can you it. also explain that? And um, it, and bet the difference between B and C when it says like solely in court history and then also like between the mixed bag too. Okay, good. That, so that that is precisely why I intended uh, A and B to be false is, is that that adverb solely, right? Um, like I said, you, you could have guessed number three likely because I, I try to, um, when there's a, a like I said, a, a kind of a, a bifurcation between two very different interpretations of the same topic, I try to cover both of them, right? And let you guys think for yourselves. So uh, in one number, right? And the court historical uh, uh, section, uh, they were depicted as crusaders, as idealistic, right, ahead of their generation. But then in a revisionist-like section, I kind of adhere to William Dunning's thesis, that they were more bent upon revenge, that they were more bent upon dividing and conquering the white South, uh, rather than simply helping out African Americans. So hence, it may not have been a good um, way of articulating it, but that's what I meant. That's what I mean by a mixed bag, that they were bold and altruistic and idealistic as, as in court history, but they were also vindictive and with limited zeal as, as revisionist history would imply, right? And you know, D is not correct because they were anything but libertarians. They, they wanted to increase government intervention. Uh, so they, they certainly were not libertarian. Okay, thank you. You're very um, welcome. Are we gonna get an argumentative assignment or just a test this week? Uh, just a test. Yeah, like I said, it works out that way. It just worked out perfectly that way that you have a 17 week semester and you have 14 assignments and three tests. So, so yeah, it just it, to me, it just worked out perfectly that, that you get to have a week for each thing. Is the test posted yet or? It is, yes. Okay. It, it, yeah, the test and the first three quizzes are, are posted as of, uh, as of yesterday and um, they're, they're under quizzes. Yes, sir. Okay, thank you. You're welcome, Jaden. So anyone else? Anyone else have a question or comment? Yeah. Um, there, yes, sir. I was just wondering in regards towards the quiz. Um, I know I saw you commented that uh, the first and second quiz were supposed to be unlimited attempts, but and then the third, from the third one, it's just a single, one single try. But on the second quiz, I was only allowed one try. Really, on the second quiz? Okay, well, I will, uh, here, I'm writing that down right now, Kevin. Because that was definitely not intended. Yeah, you, you kind of have to go out of your way uh, on, the, on the instructor side. Uh, you kind of have to go out of your way to make it available, uh, to, uh, to, to make it unlimited. And so I just must have omitted. I must have just not taken the effort and noticed or remembered uh, to do that. So I'm, I'm glad you mentioned it. I will definitely change that. So for sure, 
Um, I've even gone back and forth on quiz three on, on allowing unlimited or not, but certainly uh, the first two. So I, I'll definitely change that, Kevin. Thank you for bringing that to my attention. All right, so um, can I get a can I get a thumbs up or something from everyone that you've been able to uh, hear me that you feel relatively prepared for this? Remember, you have until Sunday night. Thank you, Laura. Thank you so much for doing this. You're welcome. You're welcome. And also, and also for giving us the pages when we do the assignments. No problem. Yeah. Yeah. To be honest, that's kind of new. And, and so uh, that, that reinforces to me that it, that it is a good idea. Uh, Jaden, you telling me that. So I, um, I'm happy to do it. Hey, Derek, are we going to have a uh, for a future test? Are we going to do the same thing like this? Like go over the questions? Yes. Okay. Yeah. I'll, I'll do this for all three tests. Okay, good. But but Thank test you. but but Laura, test two and three, I probably will only allow you to do one submission though, okay? Okay. That'll be the only difference. Okay, that's fine. All right. So um yeah, you guys, I'm just I'm happy for you. Thank you. Uh for letting me see you. I um I'm happy to see you guys. I'm happy to, to meet with you. Uh I, I would imagine I, I'm uh, not in the minority, hi Kevin. That I'm not in the minority. I I love my job, love my job, and constantly trying to read and constantly trying to improve my assignments. And um, and I'm I'm happy to help you guys. So thank you. You guys are uh, your numbers are always the highest too for those who at attend my zooms. So I'm very grateful for that from this particular class. And it makes me all the more desirous of just being able to meet with you guys. And I tell you what, I got a recent email. I know it's a little bit late in the game, but I'll send you guys an announcement. I got a recent email from uh, from MJC uh, asking if any of us would volunteer for um, office time. And so I'm going to respond to that in, in, in the affirmative. So if they have an office for me, um, I, I'm going to do that. Uh, but kind of like the Zooms, I got to confess that, that you know, it, it'll be, it'll be a contingent upon my schedule and, and also uh, perhaps even more so uh, what is left available, right? Because we have a, a fairly decently uh, large uh, department of full-timers and adjuncts. So especially if a lot of the, the fellow adjuncts like myself are uh, replying in the affirmative, uh, I, I may be very limited in, as to when I can do it. Uh, but I'll let you know, okay? I'll respond to that uh, this afternoon, probably just right after this video. And I'll, I'll see what they tell me as far as when I can do it. Want to second what Jaden said, or uh, I think it was Jaden. These uh, study guides are absolutely crucial to my success in this class. No, thank you, Kevin. No, I appreciate that. Like I said, it, it um, I used to have a study guide, as you know, Kevin, and I would just have the topic, and that's all. But but I thought, you know what? Why not let them see the actual questions? And so doing that, uh, and especially rewriting my test, um, uh, doing that has... Um, has helped me because I'm never happy with past tests. I always want to improve. And um, and it keeps me on the ball, right? I got to every week, I got I to gotta write about 10 questions out uh, to uh, see what I want to have you know, covered. And I'm glad that it helps you. And that gives me the encouragement that it is a decent idea that I should stick with. Kevin, I like I like seeing your little boy. Uh, he's partying back there. <laughs> well, he's taking advantage that I can't that I can't regulate him right now. That's right. That's right. He's no dummy. 
he digged into the big ass bag of chips, and I'm like, all right, just wait for I finish this Zoom class real quick. <laughs> Well, don't be too harsh on him. <laughs> it's, uh, no, it's it's, when the, it's what is it? When the cats sure. away, the mice will play, right? <laughs> That's right. And he takes a, he definitely knows when the cats are away for sure. That's right. <laughs> well, you guys, uh, honestly, I, I, I don't have to say this. Uh, oftentimes I finish and, you know, of course I'm, I try to be polite and all that, but I, I really enjoy this class. I really do. And, and wish I had been able to meet in person with you guys in, in the school. Uh, I appreciate you. And I think I'm going to give you guys, I'm going to write down for myself. I'm going to give you guys 10 points this time instead of five extra credit sticking with me and and so you'll have 10 points added to your score notice that you have 35 questions so um, most of the time i'll have uh, at least 40 uh so whatever is is lacking to 50 that's your that's your curve so i, I just give you 15 points and make it out of 50. all right so whatever you see in your raw score out of 35 just in your minds, add 15 to it. And that's what you have out of 50. But in your particular case, those of you who are here with me today, uh, you actually could add 25 points. I'm gonna add 10. Thank you, Derek. You're very welcome. Okay, so I appreciate you, you guys. You guys have a good week. All right, Derek. Thank you. Thank you, man. All right, so Thank take you, care. you too. Thank you. And you you take care and do well on that test. Oh thank uh, you. You gotta take care of the quiz though, right, Derek? Yes, for sir. Quiz number two. Quiz two. Uh, quiz right. two will become unlimited for sure. All right, thank you. Thank you, Kevin. All right, bye everyone. Bye. Thank bye. you. Have a good day. Bye, Jaden. Bye, Narion. Bye. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. What Getting the questions early really helps and it helps me dig into the questions really good. Oh, good, good. Well, good, so thank I, I assure you that that weighs heavily with me because when I when I did it for the first time this semester, I I wasn't sure of what I thought about it, but now I feel, now I feel secure that it's a good idea. Okay, yeah, I'm learning more from it. Good, good, Jaden. That makes me happy. Yeah, thank you. All right, you're very welcome. All right, you and your family take care, okay, Jaden? Okay, thank you. All right, bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.